So this is our wonderful original panel that we had put together that had folks from different small liberal arts colleges, librarians, technologists, teaching faculty. There is a short link to the slide deck on the screen. So if you would prefer to have slides on your own device, Bitly is there. And then in the last three weeks, as I'm sure everyone on the call has experienced, has happened. And so now the panel is constituted of Jaren and I. So we're going to be deviating a little bit from what was originally in the abstract for this session. We're going to be doing a deeper dive into a particular case study here at Grinnell. And we're excited to have hopefully a larger conversation with folks that are participating here about and um, about kind of what you are doing at your institution, other ideas that you have about particularly the intersection of data science, DH pedagogy, and language and literature courses. I know it's been something that in my own background has been an evolving area for me. I have my, I'm comfortable enough in Spanish, but I'm certainly by no means a language and literature expert. And so it's been something that's stretched me intellectually, technically, pedagogically, and we're excited to share that conversation. Jaron, if you want to introduce yourself too. Yeah, uh, my name is Jaron Santos. Uh, I used to work for Grinnell College, and I'm also a alumni of the institution. I now work over at uh, JMI Laboratories. And so um, this was one of the projects that I had worked on uh, right before I had left from Grinnell, but I'm more than happy to uh, present some of the experiences and perspectives that I've had working with uh, foreign language data and how to make that information not only accessible, but also usable for students who may not have uh, vast technical experience. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, uh, Katie and I will have, you know, elucidated to the fact that we have created these platforms, these applications, and these systems for uh, students to really get a good grasp of how to work with foreign language data, but also think critically about uh, the things that we can find in some of the case studies that we have presented here today. Mm -hmm. And so just to kick it off, so the other reason that it's very important to have Jaren with us is he is our resident data scientist. So I didn't think we could responsibly keep data science in the title without a data scientist in the conversation. My role at Grinnell, I work within our academic technology unit, which at Grinnell is housed in our Center for Teaching. Jaren, if you want to say more about kind of the position you occupied at Grinnell. Say that one more time, Katie. If you want to say more about the position you occupied at Grinnell, just to give yeah. folks a little bit of foundation of who we are before we jump in. No, totally. So um, when I was at Grinnell, I was the data scientist for the data analysis and social inquiry lab, Dazzle for short. And so what I did in my capacity was work with a variety of students, faculty, and staff to equip research, uh, pedagogy, and assignment materials with a data science context. And that helped a lot of us get more familiar with data, understand the concepts that come with it. And something that I had learned while working in the uh, social science slash data science context is that we have lots of uh, collaborations across disciplines, including the humanities themselves. And so um, working with Katie, I had the opportunity to um, work with a wonderful set of students in producing some novel analyses of, uh, we'll, we'll get to it in the presentation, but reggaeton song data. And that is uh, hopefully something in the mix that we'll elaborate upon later. And so we'll talk more about that institutional context, but to go ahead and dive in how we're going to frame this presentation, and we really do look forward to the conversation after, we're going to talk a little bit about what our liberal arts context looks like at Grinnell. We're gonna frame some organizing questions. We'll walk through a few kind of, so we'll do some surface level dives into a few pedagogical examples from our foreign language and literature courses. We'll do a deep dive into a particular case study, and then we'll come back around for some questions and conversation at the end. And so just to frame what our liberal arts context looks like at Grinnell, we are talking about interdisciplinary curriculum structures, even though courses might exist in a particular department, there's just a very interdisciplinary framing to what a 
robust foundational liberal arts education looks like. We have an open curriculum, so there are not general education distribution requirements. So our students move across the curriculum in really interesting ways. And because we are an undergraduate only liberal arts college, pedagogy and innovation and pedagogy is really at the center of what we do. And that shows up in different ways. I think also, and I'll talk more about this with a focus on data science and digital humanities, we've seen a lot of spaces for curricular experimentation for faculty to be trying new things in the classroom to be supported as they're doing that work for folks to maybe launch a research project that then has a pedagogy offshoot or start something in the classroom that then grows to become kind of a long-standing digital project and I think particularly again at these questions of data science and digital humanities and digital scholarship we've seen a lot of momentum over the last four to six years in those areas. And just by nature of our size, Grinnell is 1,600 students, although 1,200 of them are no longer on campus. We had the great exodus before spring break, so campus feels very different right now. But um, particularly when we're all in residence on campus, it's both a small campus physically in terms of number of people, but it is also a community that is built on relationships. And so just to dig a little bit more institutions, but particularly liberal arts colleges, we have resources that are highly decentralized and distributed. I'll talk a little more about some of the grant structures that have really seeded some of this work, but we have kind of hard funded lines in academic technology for digital scholarship and the library, as well as for our data analysis and social inquiry lab. But we've also had some soft money move in that has facilitated different kinds of innovation. And we also have had kind of curricular structures percolating, particularly we have a digital studies concentration that passed a faculty vote and is going online in the fall. And even before that formal curriculum pathway was opening up, we had an increased number of classes that were taking up digital methods, digital assignments, different kinds of digital projects. And I'll just do my wonderful favorite graphic that shows exactly particularly what our distributed network looks like. We have our Center for Teaching and my team, DLAC, our academic technology team within that. We have our libraries, we have ITS, we have Dazzle Data Analysis and Social Inquiry, and we've had a few different granting structures. We've had a four-year Mellon grant, Digital Bridges for Humanistic Inquiry, that was a partnership between University of Iowa and Grinnell College that wrapped up a year and a half ago. And then we have also had a number of data science uh, related initiatives that have developed tied to a large donation um, and a grant that turned into other seed grants. Jaren, I don't know if you want to say more about the Carver grant and what it was doing in relation to data science. <laughs> Yeah, so the Carver Grant at Grinnell College was able to establish a data science structure and foundation, not only in the classroom, but also for various research activities too. And so we were able to help facilitate this growing interest in uh, data science fundamentals and how to apply data science concepts and techniques that we would find in industry into the classroom. And it really gave uh, faculty and staff members this ability to you know, as Katie had mentioned before, uh, experiment pedagogically with what materials were normally in the classroom. And so we've been able to, for example, include uh, video game simulations where uh, selecting different types of uh, cars or tower defense strategies or role playing would uh, produce certain metadata for students to then analyze in various statistics classes, for example. Um, another way that we would do this is um, in global migrations classes or in global development studies courses, uh, we would help uh, students take some of the concepts they've learned and look for uh, extensive data sources where they could see some of the concepts that they've learned uh, come to life, right? Um, we've been very fortunate to have uh, different sources of uh, hard line money and soft uh, sources of money too. So it's been it's been established, I think, in the data science uh, community at Grinnell. And I think it's growing even more when we look at the digital humanities at Grinnell as well. And so to kind of jump into some organizing questions, I think one of the to share and start this conversation is I think particularly even locally at Grinnell, 
there's been not an explicit division across disciplines or units, but there's been this de facto distinction where folks that are working in the social sciences or data science communities end up working with our data analysis lab, and then folks that are coming in with a digital humanities or digital scholarship orientation end up working with the libraries and or our academic technology team. So I think, you know, again, the question of very decentralized and distributed resources, there's been some serendipitous or not an inadvertent siloing that's happened. And so I think one of the things that we'll talk about here is what does it look like to really collaborate across interdisciplinary units? I think particularly to the projects that we're talking about, how can digital humanities in the foreign language and literature classroom benefit and collaborate and co-create with folks in the data science community as well as other campus partners. Um, we're excited for Jaron's future professional opportunities, but we very much miss having him at Grinnell to build that partnership across our digital humanities, academic technology, and data science unit. We're also gonna be thinking about what does project management look like or how does digital curriculum development maybe look different when it's happening in a foreign language and literature context. And we're going to also just think about some broader questions of how can deploying DH in the foreign language and literature undergraduate classroom also start to address questions of digital literacy, intercultural competency, while also supporting existing curricular goals. So I'm going to talk kind of about a few broad examples, and there are lots of links in the slides. I'm happy to talk about more of these in depth. Just to talk about, I think at Grinnell over the last three to four years, we've really had a culture change, particularly in our Spanish department, but we're also seeing it in our French department too, and a little bit trickling in Russian languages about faculty that are thinking about digital methods, are in their own research and intellectual practice getting connected to the digital humanities. And so we've had, this is an example of an upper division Spanish course that was doing work with text analysis and looking at some historical letters from the colonial contact era, as well as starting to do some work with um, interactive digital mapping using ArcGIS and students actually were doing some work in story maps with historical maps. So again, we've had these moments, particularly in our upper division classes, where folks have kind of explored what it might look like to bring digital humanities into the classroom space. We've also had, this is another one of our Spanish faculty members who's working with a research project that has involved a number of different student researchers and we're thinking about what it will look like to bring that work back into the classroom. We had a, a new hire in our French department maps. And so now we have this whole cluster of French faculty who are gung-ho about story maps. I'm like, it's fantastic. Maybe we'll come back when we're not in the middle of a pandemic and work with you on this. But uh, we've had some of our French courses and not just upper level courses, even kind of our 200 and 100 levels be interested in thinking about what a platform for digital projects might look like to open up different kinds of student engagement and learning. And I think it's been really, in this specific instance of our French department, been really interesting and exciting to see a new fire come in, have ideas, get connected with resources, and then other faculty members in the department be paying attention to that and be maybe intrigued is not the best word, but it's a word that I'll use. And so I think that's a pattern that we're starting to see in other places where either existing folks will be trying new things and that starts to create a culture of change or folks will come in and try new things. This is a course that was actually supposed to be online this semester. It was going to do some global learning during the semester. Students, it's an upper division Spanish language and literature course, but over spring break, students were originally supposed to be on the ground in Spain doing site visits, doing some live GIS data collection work and collecting digital assets to build some multimedia digital projects when they were back on the ground. And I'm showing this partially to alleviate my own heartbreak that they didn't actually get to complete this project because our travel restrictions went into place long before spring break and so the whole original vision of students being on the ground in Spain visiting sites in Barcelona and Seville that are actually connected to the faculty members research and then bringing all of that live data collection back into campus. Unfortunately they didn't actually get to do it but we had the infrastructure and maybe in the future. And so I'll jump in and talk a little bit more of the foundations of the case study that we're going to dive into. This is again one of our Spanish faculty members 
authors who I think we're seeing across the board, but particularly I'll mention in our language and literature courses, an increased awareness that kind of digital literacy or digital methods need to be scaffolded within the major curriculum. And I think that's a conversation that's still really early for us, but it's happening in different divisions, especially in history and English. We're starting to see it in religious studies, but especially in our language departments. I think part of that is a reality that's about enrollments, about um, making foreign language and literature courses appealing to students. And there are a lot of different questions and structures and systems that are undergirding those questions. Um, but I think for some of our faculty members, they are seeing digital as a way to continue to innovate in their own pedagogy to increase student engagement. And along the way, not just giving students these transferable technical skills, but also introducing them to a mode of inquiry and a method of analysis in the discipline that our faculty are kind of deciding is important for undergraduate students to be introduced to. So Literature again on the slides, but this is kind of traditionally a span upper division Spanish course that would focus on textual analysis and largely they had done that through a lot of close reading. And so the instructor kind of prior to the fall semester reached out and just was curious, you know, what would it look like to have students do traditional close reading of Spanish language texts, but also give them opportunities to engage in some text analysis and again they're not going to full on learn Python to do NLP in an upper division undergraduate Spanish course, but what are some tools or platforms or resources we could use that would get them started with text analysis and distant reading and some of those other methodologies so they could put that in conversation with the kinds of close reading textual analysis they were doing and what would it look like to scaffold that for a final project that brings together different kinds of research or different methods of engagement, particularly for a class that was talking about um, cultures of reggaeton music. So I'll popcorn it over to Jaron here, who will talk about some of the infrastructure that we had to develop to make this class happen. And Jaron, just let me know when you want me to advance slides. Yeah, for sure. And so um, I just want to highlight the fact that um, I have an interesting perspective in this space because I was both a student at Grinnell, uh, went to my grad school for like a year, and then immediately entered as a staff member. So I think there's this institutional memory perspective that I have here about how, I'll use the word digitized, some of our foreign language classes have been. Mm. And this has been only uh, a growing interest and feature that I wasn't able to see too clearly when I was a student. And so um, note that some of these developments and changes and as you grow can rapidly change and happen all at once. And so thanks to the work of Katie, um, those interested in digital studies and just this whole way of getting students more involved in using different digital methods um, has been a recent occurrence. And um, to that, uh, I ha we have a couple of uh, Slack conversations that uh, we, uh, Katie and I have had uh, over the summer prior to this uh, Spanish text analysis, analysis class happening. And so for those that don't know, uh, Slack is kind of like a uh, workspace slash communication application that is free to download and use, but uh, we use it to help manage different teams and different projects across the board. And so uh, for those that are just listening over the phone or through audio, I'll go ahead and read some of the text that's happening in our Slack uh, conversation. So that way, we really, we really debated that. if we should put the Slack in there, but we we're going to show you how the sausage gets made. Right. And this is just to show that even the most uh, informal conversations or out of the nowhere conversations can grow organically into these really interesting digital projects that, you know, help convene uh, data science, uh, digital humanities, uh, foreign languages, and different interdisciplinary fields. And so, uh, there's this uh, question that Katie poses on me where uh, one of the Spanish faculty is wanting students to work with uh, text analysis of reggaeton songs and lyrics in a uh, upper level Spanish class. And so uh, she offers the hip hop word count database, which could be a potential data source, but there's not too much uh, back and forth on their end. And so uh, genius and lyrics.com would be some of our uh, 
uh, go-tos because immediately those are uh, databases and APIs that we can tap to that have uh, not just Spanish lyrics, but just a lot of foreign language uh, lyrics and songs from across the globe. And so at this time, I was thinking to myself, wait, I had totally seen a Twitter post about this maybe like a day or two ago. And so uh, Josiah Perry, who works on the R Studio team, uh, has an R package called uh, Genius R or Genius, I think. And so um, he's helped create this package to allow uh, others to interface song lyrics data from Genius, which is a lyrics website. And so, uh, Katie, if you want to go advance to the next slide, I went ahead and uh, just sent the link over to it. And being someone with uh, musical interest, not just in uh, pop music charts, but also foreign language songs too, I specifically listen to a lot of uh, uh, salsa, reggaeton, and bachata songs, as well as some Korean pop sprinkled here and there. Um, I was like, oh, this is so interesting. Maybe I can see if we can even take some of this foreign language lyric data that exists on Genius and make it into a usable format. And so, you know, uh, we're just talking about here and there, you know, maybe check also Billboard or YouTube that may have some uh, songs that could be used because we were thinking of just some song examples, right? We weren't thinking about opening the whole can of worms and letting students go crazy with this, right? <laughs> and so um, I, at the time, was working on some uh, policy development for uh, the data analysis and social inquiry lab and just like many of us have we we have some downtime here and there and i started playing with the genius r package and you know here in this slide basically katie says something along the lines of i could probably knock this out by the time the class needs it um and you know we'll try and get like a set of data ready and then i say oh, maybe there, there's a way to get all access to the data set here, right? And I'll, um, jump I'll, in, and I'll jump in and say, if I knock this out, this is as someone who does not work extensively in R, I could probably hack a workflow that would give students some sample data sets to work on for tutorials, not anything that would be production level corpus that students could actually scrape themselves for their own research projects. So it was kind of a workflow that we'd cobble some things together and make it happen, but it would not be pretty. <laughs> right. And as somebody that has had experience with R, I knew that I could probably tackle this issue a little bit uh, more uh, appropriately, I guess. Maybe that's a lack of words, but um, I, I knew a lot more about what data could be parsed from the package and from uh, going into the API, thanks to the Genius package. And uh, Katie, go to the next slide. Um, so basically what I had originally planned is, okay, um, we're not teaching students to use R and know all about these data structures. We just want them to get data to work with, analyze, and play with, right? There isn't the need pedagogically for them to suddenly have to pick up a programming language. It's just a means of getting data. And so initially I had said, I'll get an R script ready. All they have to do is just run the script, whether that means highlighting everything and pressing command enter or control enter, or whether that means going to the bash script, typing the name of the file and then having that run, right? And then I'm thinking, okay, what are some uh, file friendly formats that people are used to using? Because I'm pretty sure not everyone would like to receive an XML file and suddenly have to dig into that right off the bat. So something friendly like uh, an XLSX file, which is a, a file used for Excel, or a CSV file would be uh, more than appropriate. And then that begin began to grow even more. And I was like, let's throw away the R script. Let's just make an application, a web application for these students to use. So that way students have to wouldn't even have to worry about, you know, whether or not syntax is wrong or whether or not a code error appears. Let's just get them some type of GUI, a graphical user interface for them to simply take a song, copy and paste it into an app, and then run it and get the lyrics right off the bat. And so I was like, okay, this might take a couple of days. I got it done in a day because it was pretty fun to do, right? Not every day do you get to collaborate across so many different fields. And I think 
you know, aside from the chat, this is one of the beauties that come with organically collaborating with uh, the digital humanities and the uh, foreign languages fields um, that doesn't happen on a day-to-day -day basis. But coming together and finding out which person or which party or which group can help bring these to life is certainly an exploration that one needs to feel like they can do. They need to not only feel that they are compelled to do so, but just not be afraid to reach out a hand and say, hey, I know you, or hey, you can help with this. How do we get this going together? And so we have a link to the app later, but basically I have a Shiny app called, a Shiny is a web-based platform in R, and we have a web application called the Genius app that I had created. And basically it takes whatever output you see in R from the Genius package and spits it out into a more user-friendly uh, graphical user interface, okay? And so what happens is that you're presented with instructions. All you have to do is go into the uh, Genius Lyric song website that you wanna take. And so I provided some examples there, right? Uh, Lemon by Nerd and Rihanna, Vivir Mi Vida by Mark Anthony, and even the ever so popular Gangnam Style by Psy. Um, as potential song lyrics that people could pull from. But as long as you're able to pull a specific song from Genius, you could enter the URL here, enter it, submit it, and then it'll spit out a XLSX slash CSV document that prints on this uh, page. And so I think here I took a Daddy Yankee song because Daddy Yanke Yankee is a popular reggaeton artist and just tried it out and voila you kind of see the first few entries here but if you press download you would get the whole entire csv or xlsx file for students to then explore on their own end um that's something that i didn't expect to happen so quickly and organically but to my surprise it was a usable tool for not just students to use but just for anybody to use and pick up um, and so, and Jared, well, I might jump in here. Yeah, I know we had some back and forth as you were building the tool for how exactly the output was going to be structured in terms of what fields it would keep, how it would split line and lyric data. I don't yeah. know if you want to say more about that, but I think you ran into some really interesting questions. In this case, you know, there's both a broader audience for a tool like this, and then there's a very specific pedagogical use case. There's also the question that, you know, in the particular use case that we have in mind for this class, we're dealing with Spanish language textual data or kind of Spanish English hybrid spaces, but we're also thinking about the fact that Genius has languages that are wide ranging in their structure and syntax, wherever you want to go with that. No, for sure. And that was something that I think we need to keep in mind when working with foreign language data, right? Uh, typically, we might be used to uh, traditional encoding of English words, for example, where in the English language, uh, we're not so familiar with the accent over the A or the tilde over the NA, right? And if we're even far reaching into like some symbolic languages, right? We're not used to Hangul in Korean or uh, some of the uh, pinyin or Mandarin that's used there in uh, ch the Chinese language. But we had to keep that in mind when finding a tool that could help parse that information over to the students, you know, because sometimes when working with Microsoft Excel, I know that there are plenty of people that have had this issue, but sometimes your A with the accent will become apostrophe, semicolon, two, three, four. And that's kind of the way that technology will parse that data to understand that this is a foreign language letter, right? Um, in this Excel document, like sometimes you'll see that A with the tilde that just comes out of nowhere. I don't think that's part of the word at all. And um, we had to really get creative in troubleshooting and figuring out you know, why this is happening, how can students, you know, actually do their text analysis without having apostrophe semicolon two, three, four be the most popularly used word in this database, right? Um, and so we had to reach out to tools that didn't just go into Excel, but also into a variety of different technologies. And so one way to help look at this information and data is to use something like Notepad++, 
or even Google Sheets, which takes into account some of the proper UTF-8 encoding for these uh, words. Oftentimes that happens to be, I, not even oftentimes, the, probably the number one problem that I see students run into. It's like, hey, Excel's not showing me uh, the data that I want appropriately. How do I get over this hump? And so I'm like, hey, uh, let's look at this in a different format. Maybe not, you, not use .xlsx, maybe just stick with .csv, right? Uh, if you want to venture out into structuring this data as a .json file, go for it. But uh, that's another yeah. hurdle that we can even yeah. talk about. But, you know, um, the interesting thing about this project and in the context of Grinnell is that over at Dazzle, we not only help uh, students, faculty, and staff with research and independent projects, but we also help them on a day-to-day -day basis with... Uh, daily assignment troubleshooting. We have a set of uh, 16 to 18 student employees that have some type of data specific training. And so we're all able to collaborate and help in this uh, service based uh, arena to get students with this type of data issues, uh, the help that they need. Uh, along with that, uh, Katie, as well as some of the uh, employees over at Dazzle were able to uh, help create uh, tutorials for some of these different technologies that can be used. And this is just also, this doesn't include just working with CSVs or spreadsheets, but also just data structures in general, right? And so the tutorials you can actually access over at that link that's provided at the bottom of the slide. Uh, Katie has a repository on GitHub with a variety of these tutorials and uh, explore more of those because th there's a lot of rich information there that can be used not just with foreign language data but also GIS data. I'll give a little shout out there. Um, and I'll, jump, so, I'll jump in really quickly yeah. just to <laughs> kind of put a pin on this too. I think yeah. our team has been having conversations about student digital literacy for about a year now and thinking about what does it look like to bake digital literacy and digital literacy pedagogy into the different kinds of instructional work that we're doing. And so this is one of those moments when I originally conceptualized this project, I did not think that I would be having, be having to help students think through encoding schema and CSV versus Excel. Oh, thank you for the time signal. I did not think that you know, in the context of introducing students to text analysis, we'd also having be having to talk about UTF-8 and other kinds of schema. So I think it was a really interesting moment for me to think through how the foreign language and literature class in choosing technologies, particularly we had to make a series of kind of jigsaw technology choices. And I'm happy to say more about this. It's one of those moments we got to the end of it. And I'm like, we should have just used in vivo, but I didn't know that at the start. So the more you learn. Um, and so I think it was even choosing tools that weren't going to cause additional problems and hiccups with getting foreign language data, or even I think particularly in this situation, I was trying to prioritize tools that had a Spanish language GUI interface option so that students weren't having to break out of the language that was the primary mode of instruction and learning for the class. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have proficient Spanish speaking and writing abilities. So when I was giving instruction, that was in English, but we tried to prioritize finding tools that had a Spanish language interface option just so students were thinking about these larger questions of technology and power and what are our default languages when you open some of these browser-based tools or software tools or even understanding the distinctions across these tools and what kinds of data they'll take. And I'll give a huge shout out, particularly given the patchwork of tools that we were using. Some of our student mentors and folks over in the data analysis lab were able to provide some peer mentoring support because I think this is an interesting thing that Jaren and I can talk about more. But some of these things with natural language processing, computational linguistics that we're dumping our feet in are more things that happen in the social sciences side of the spectrum and are not necessarily things, at least in our institutional context, that were happening within the library and digital humanities unit. So it was, I think, a moment where our Spanish instructor was walking in thinking digital humanities, and I was making the crosswalk of we actually need our data science and our data analysis folks to really be able to do this well, develop the infrastructure we need to do this well, but also to be able to continue to support students as they're dealing with the learning curve of technologies and are continuing to think about how to use these tools for their own research projects. Sorry, Jaren, feel free to jump back in. No, that's totally okay. I think you got a really good grasp of uh, basically what I wanted to say too. A lot of the things that we encounter in data science and social science. I was posing this uh, with Katie when we were uh, practicing our presentation earlier this week. You know, these are some of the things that 
I think come naturally with a discipline, right? Like when you work in the statistics field or the data science field, you immediately jump to data structures and the foundations that, you know, help contain data in ways that are understandable for uh, people to read and see and use, right? Whereas in the humanities, um, you definitely look more at the critical theory that comes through and then worry about the data afterwards. But then when in data science, we don't know jack about <laughs> the critical theory that happens here. And so these collaborations are necessary to understand, you know, what is the use case? What is the need? Uh, you know, as much as I can uh, throw a fancy app together for people to use, I won't know exactly how that will be helpful, especially in the classroom context, right? And so that's where people like Katie, uh, Mirzam, uh, come in and help provide and contextualize the situations that we're working in. And it's really this organic process that happens at Grinnell and at this institution. But we imagine that other people can take these use cases and situations and bring it to their own project management or their own institutions as well. So again, if folks want to see kind of what some of the students were doing, flavors of their final project are up online. And we want to come back to, again, we originally envisioned this being kind of a breakout conversation that comes back together, but we're in a virtual space. So I will put those organizing questions back up on the screen. And we would are happy to take questions about particular parts of any of these examples or pieces that we've touched on. But we're also really excited to hear from others. What are they seeing or what are they involved in? What do they see happening? happening at their local institution in any of these areas. Thank you all.